For added strength Your courage to renew Do not be disheartened I have good news for you Again, a series. It's going to be probably five or six weeks long, maybe six or eight, depending on how long winded I get. But uh, uh, on meaningful meals. Now, uh, we have a meaningful meal, you know, as far as part of our culture here in the United States during November. A meaningful meal with turkey and, and uh, ham and stuffing and all various kinds of desserts. No calorie desserts. Right? <laughs> Of course, I had one of the teachers, he and I kind of exchanged monies there at school, uh, and uh, he told me, you know what kind of key doesn't, uh, doesn't fit any door? Yeah. A turkey. Oh. turkey. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but at any rate, there's, uh, that was a bad joke. Uh, but, but at any rate, we have that meal that we have as family, and we have for many years, no doubt, most of us. And uh, we're not commanded in Scripture to celebrate that, to be sure. But I think Thanksgiving, every time that we have opportunity, is a good thing to do, right? And in Scripture, there are meaningful meals that some of them, like the one that we're going to look at tonight, actually was prescribed to happen on a regular basis, uh, on an annual basis. We're going to look at the Passover meal. Now, some of the meals, that they happened and they weren't necessarily prescribed, but they are very meaningful as to what happened in the course of them. Last week we began this series by talking about Isaac's meal in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 27. If you recall, Isaac's meal. Isaac, the son of Abraham, one of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? And Isaac's meal is he thought he was getting ready to die. Now, he lived for many more decades past that. But he thought he was getting ready to die, and he wanted to pass the blessing on to his son Esau, although he knew that God had intended for the blessing, because a prophecy had come when the two children were born, that the blessing was actually going to Jacob, the younger brother. And so he delved into that last week, how it was that, that Isaac, he was in decline in many ways, not just physically, but spiritually there was evidence of some decline. 
Rebecca, she was desiring. In other words, she was going to ultimately want to work it out to where God's will would be performed. But I don't know that her concern was so much about God's will as it was that she wanted to scheme and plan and make sure that her favorite son got the blessing. We talked about Jacob, how he was a deceiver. And because he went in and he told his dad that he was Esau and he was not. And he deceived him in many ways. We talked about Esau despising, that he despised his birthright. He, did, he wanted the blessings. How many know most everybody wants a blessing of some sort? But he didn't want all that the birthright entailed that he despised. He considered it not worth very much to be the head of his household and to also be uh, a priest to his family in some regard. And so he belittled that. He despised him. And then we talked lastly about how it depicted Christ who was to come. And we talked about that in many ways. How it was Christ who was to come as far as in his incarnate ministry. Or being flesh and dwelling among us. But we talked about how Christ was depicted. And the main way was this. Jacob, his very name means supplanter, deceiver. One who takes the place of another. And how many are thankful that Jesus took our place? Not in a deceptive way, not in a way such as Jacob did, but it foreshadows. Somebody took our place, aren't you thankful? Somebody took our place. And now aren't you thankful that when the father, Isaac, he was deceived into thinking that it was Esau. Aren't you thankful that our Heavenly Father, he's not deceived. He has eyes wide open. But if you're in Christ, aren't you glad that when he looks at you, he sees the record of Christ instead of, instead of our, he doesn't impute, uh, hold our sins against if you're in Christ. Isn't that good news? Well, if you know your history, and many of you do, of course, from Genesis, is that what happens? We have Isaac, and Isaac has a son named Jacob, the third of the patriarchs. And Jacob... He will have, a, he'll be the one to get the blessing, and he, of course, will have 12 sons, ultimately, and the, young, the next youngest of those sons will be Joseph. And how many remember Joseph wasn't particularly liked by his brothers? Joseph had, I, I will, we did a, and maybe we'll do some me, uh, uh, messages on this, we did some two or three years ago, but Joseph, the life of Joseph is such a pointer to Christ in his ministry in Genesis, it's just I mean, it's, it's uh, only God could be so brilliant as to have something so many uh, hundreds, hundreds of years before Christ's incarnation to point to his ministry in such a powerful way. But here it is. We have Joseph. Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers and he goes into Egypt. And through a series of events, he has some ups, he has some downs. But ultimately, he rises to be second in command of Egypt, the most powerful nation at the time. And when it is that uh, Joseph is reconciled with his brothers, and he, what does Joseph do? But all the rest of the world is in a famine. Egypt has food. Joseph brings his brothers and their family and his dad down into the land of Egypt from the Holy Land where they were at, the land of Canaan. He brings them down into Egypt. And while there, because Joseph is second in command, the Pharaoh at the time says, give them the choicest land. And that was the land of Goshen. Give them the choicest of lands. Well, after Joseph dies, eventually what transpires, as Scripture puts it this way, there arises a Pharaoh, a leader of Egypt, who did not remember Joseph. How many know forgetting things is one of the most uh, terrible things that can happen, and forgetting important things. There arose a Pharaoh that didn't remember that Joseph, and subsequently this blessing that would pass on to Joseph's family, that Joseph had been used to spare their kingdom, and to spare the world, really, in many ways. All right? And again, there's... Uh, typological uh, foreshadowing of Christ. Joseph was used in a figurative way to save the world at the time. How do we know Jesus came to save the world? All those that would put their trust in him. There's famine everywhere else. Only Jesus has salvation, right? Yeah. And so here it is, is that there arose a Pharaoh eventually that didn't remember Joseph. And rather than treating the descendants of Joseph and his family with respect, they turned them into slaves. And so the people of God are in Egyptian slavery for about 400 years. And then God raises up a deliverer. And who is that deliverer? But Moses. And Moses, when we come to Exodus chapter 12, what has happened is Moses, he's about 80 at this time. And I won't go into all the life of Moses because that's not the subject of tonight's message. But under Moses, Moses comes to Pharaoh and says, Pharaoh, let God's people go. And I will tell you, if you look at the line... That Moses delivers to Pharaoh. Why were God's people to be let go? That they might worship the Lord. How many know we're 
drawn out from bondage. Why? Not to say how great we are, but to worship the Lord and to give Him the glory due His name. And so here it is. It says, let my people go. Pharaoh, of course, says, no, we're not going to do it. And then God miraculously works these various plagues. The Nile River turns to blood. There's gnats and there's all these sorts of terrible oils and all sorts of terrible plagues that break out. Ten in all. Well, by the time we get to Exodus chapter 12, nine have happened. The tenth one hasn't happened yet. But nine of them have happened. And each time it is that uh, Pharaoh, uh, you would think that it would get through to him to let God's people go. But he does not let God's people go. Each one of these plagues, by the way, was geared directly toward an Egyptian god. The Egyptians worshipped the Nile River. God said, I can turn that Nile River to blood. Some of the, they, they would worship, uh, they would worship the, uh, the, the sun, and the sun would become darkened. How many know? God says he's, he's and lots of people worship the sun god, S-U-N. How many know there's a god who created the sun? You know, those who look to horoscopes and to the stars, to the heavens for uh, things about their future. It's strictly forbidden in scripture, but if you're a child of God, you don't need to look to the stars. You can look to the one who made the stars. Knows them by name. Holds all the universe in the span of his hand. How big is God, right? And so here it is, is that, that uh, all these plagues were directed showing that God, Yahweh, the God of Scripture, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is a true and living God, and all these other deities are false. Now we come to Exodus chapter 12. And what is God going to do? God is going to kill the firstborn in every house, the angel of death will come, where there's not the blood of the lamb. He's going to come and do that. And here it is, is that what will transpire, the people worshiped Pharaoh. And Pharaoh was seen to be a god. And of course, Pharaoh's son would be the son of God. And what's going to happen? But the true and living God is going to come and show that Pharaoh isn't God, nor is Pharaoh's son the son of God. There is one true and living God. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And the son of Pharaoh couldn't bring life by his death. But how many are thankful the capital S son of God could bring life by his death and resurrection from the dead. So we come here to Exodus chapter 12. And this is before this plague happens. This is before the 10th plague. And this is going to be the first instruction on the Passover meal. And the meal is what we'll focus on tonight. So Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 to 13, and then I'm going to skip down to 29 to 32. Beginning in verse 1. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, on the tenth of this month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Now, if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them, according to what each man should eat, you are to divide the lamb. Verse 5, your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Verse 7, Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two, two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head and its legs along with its entrails. And you shall not leave any of it over until morning, but whatever is left of it until morning you shall burn with fire. Now you shall eat it in this manner, with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be assigned for you on the houses where you live, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Down at verse 29. Now it came about at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon. That means firstborn of Pharaoh, the top of the mountain, 
to the firstborn of those who were in the dungeon, from the top to the bottom, and all the firstborn of cattle, verse 30. Pharaoh arose in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was no home where there was not someone dead. Then he called for Moses and Aaron at night and said, Rise up, get out from among my people, both you and the sons of Israel, and go, worship the Lord as you said. Again, Pharaoh knew that he had asked for them to go and worship the Lord. Verse 32, take both your flocks and your herds as you have said and go and bless me also. That's from Exodus chapter 12. So here we come. This is the instruction for the first Passover meal. Again, God was going to use this for the 10th plague of Egypt to kill the firstborn in every household where there was not the blood over the, the, the top of the door and the, the sides of the door where there was not the blood of the lamb. So tonight, the meal and its meaning. First is this, talking about the lamb. Of course, when you talk about the lamb, you think of the lamb of God, right? Revelation says the lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. When John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Go back to Genesis chapter 22 and verse 7. Genesis 22, a very famous scripture we've referred to it many times, where Abraham was taking Isaac up on the mountain. And Isaac, as a younger man, says, says uh, Dad, we've got the wood, we've got everything we need, but where's the lamb? Well, when we come to Exodus chapter 12, we're starting to get closer to where is that lamb? Where is the lamb for sacrifice? And of course, by the time we get to the Gospel of John, John the Baptist tells us where is the lamb. Jesus is the lamb, not just a lamb, but the lamb. Notice this lamb that was picked out for this Passover meal. They would go on the 10th day of the month, and they would select this lamb, and they would take it into their house. And they would take it into their house until the 14th of the month in order to inspect it and to have it inside of their house. Now think about this. They probably were grown attached to this lamb, perhaps anyway, it being a part of their flock. But to have that lamb inside of your house, how many know it was a precious lamb? In fact, when you go to, we were at Revelation chapter 5 on a Sunday morning not many weeks ago, and when it says, the lamb... The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. That word used there for lamb is a Greek word that means some, this, this precious lamb. This lamb that was taken not only from the flock, but taken into your own home. How many know the lamb of God, Jesus, who was to come uh, as far as in his incarnate ministry. He is the son of God, very precious to the father. Here it is, this lamb that was chosen had to be inspected. The lamb couldn't just be any lamb. It had to be an unblemished lamb. One that was spotless and without defect. How many are thankful that Jesus is the spotless lamb without defect? You think of the best person that you've ever known or that you've ever seen. And perhaps but out of love or perhaps out of respect or truth be told, perhaps out of Ignorance, your lack of full knowledge of this person that you would have the most respect for. And yet you know in your heart of hearts that they, like you, are someone who has not been perfect. How many know that's true? But there is one who is perfect. There is one who is spotless. There is one who scripture says, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. He was tempted in every way as we are, yet without what? Sin. Doesn't mean that he, uh, uh, you know, you might think of some things to you that aren't a temptation. And then to some other one might think of something that's a temptation perhaps for you, but it's not a temptation for them. In other words, something that's hard to resist. And yet, uh, the song says, the new song, we've all searched for the light of day and the dead of night. We've all uh, run to things we know just ain't right, right? And here it is, though, Jesus Tempted in every way, yet without what? Without sin. First John will say that God, Jesus of course, being the second person of the Godhead, how we are thankful in God there is light and there is no darkness at all. He's perfect in all of his ways. There is nothing about him that is not perfect. Jesus, tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin, the spotless Lamb of God. 
1 Peter 2.22, speaking of Jesus, said that not only did he not commit sin, but there was no deceit in his mouth. How many know it's one thing to, to have your deeds to where somebody might not see a sin. It's another to have your mouth where everybody can hear every word you said. And not only every word you said, but the way you said it. <laughs> and, and yet Jesus, he never sinned. Not only did he not sin in deed, he didn't sin in word. And not only did he not sin in word, and not only did he not sin in deed, but if you look at 2 Corinthians 5.21, we sang Jesus Messiah tonight. I love that song. Jesus Messiah, name above all names. I'll tell you how I picture it in my mind. You, you ever notice when we get to that one part, I'll say, Jesus Messiah, name above all names. I'll say, because I think of, like if you're introducing somebody, here's who he is. Jesus Messiah. He's got the name above all names. He's a blessed redeemer. He's Emmanuel. He's a rescue for sinners. The ransom from heaven. Jesus Messiah. He's Lord of all. I tell you, that this, that, there's something about that that gets me going. <laughs> Talking about Jesus. But here it is. Is that, that Jesus, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, we say at the first of that song, He became sin who knew no sin, that we might become His righteousness. Right? He humbled Himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Well, the way Scripture specifically puts it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, He, the Father, made Him the Son who knew no sin, to become sin or to take on sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Notice, it does there, it says, He made Him who knew no sin. In other words, Jesus, not only did He not sin indeed, tempted in every way, yet without sin, from Hebrews 4, 15. Not only did He not sin in word, from Peter's epistle, which tells us there's no deceit in His mouth, but he didn't even have sin in his nature. There's no sin. He's perfect in every way. How many are thankful? A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. Perfect in every way. No fault to be found in him. But not only was he faultless, not only was he sinless, but if you notice this lamb that we have in this, pit, in this passage, not only did they have to be spotless, sinless, when we're talking about Christ, but he also had to be inspected. Anybody ever been afraid about being inspected? I tell you, I, I would tell you, I, I, I've, I've been, been there when, when, when those I mentioned before, when the administrators of our school come through and they come through with these little keypads now. They don't even come through with written notebooks. They come through with this little, I don't know what the technical word is, but it's electronic device, notepad or whatever it is. And they, they come, tablet, that's it. I knew it would come to me if I just kept talking. But tablet, they come through and they're going to give you some kind of a, a rating. Tell you, nothing will make your heart go like this to know that your rating depends upon 12 and 13 and 14 year olds sitting in front of you hoping they're paying attention. <laughs> How many think that gets you going a little bit? But they'll come through, they'll inspect, they're looking for certain things and they'll write there, observed or not observed, and they'll, or needs improvement. That's the three things. Observe, not observed, or an area of focus. In other words, needs improvement. If you get an area of focus, well, that can be trouble. Not observed, not necessarily bad. just means they didn't see it during the time they were in there. Observed means they saw something good that they were looking for. And they sent you this. And it clicks to your email while you're there teaching the class. <laughs> you're there, they leave, and of course, the first thing you want to do is jump on that email and see what they said. But I would tell you, they come through to inspect. How many are thankful that when Jesus was inspected, everything that's good is observed. Anything that's bad is not observed because Jesus is perfect in every way. And not only do we have, so to speak, uh, man's uh, perspective on that, but more importantly, we have God's perspective on that. What is it that the Father's voice said to Jesus when he was baptized? The Father says to the Son, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I tell you, how many know there's no greater inspection than that? Then you go, you fast forward throughout the Gospels. Acts chapter 10 will tell us this, that Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And when it came time for Jesus' trumped up trial 
as he goes in front of the Jewish authorities and then ultimately in front of the Roman authorities, they inspect him. And what Pilate said was true. I find no fault in this man. How many are thankful? Jesus is the unblemished Lamb of God. He's the spotless Lamb of God. He's the sinless Lamb of God. And he meets all the inspections. Not only did this lamb have to be brought in and was a, was a, a beloved lamb, but this lamb was chosen and was inspected. Then what happened was the lamb was slain. Now there are those, and their, their number is not small. There are those who will say that Jesus' life was an example for us to live by. And we've mentioned that before. And how many know that's true? Jesus, of course, is the ultimate example. How many here want to be more like Jesus? Right? I mean, there might be some fault in how people apply this, but the question, what would Jesus do, is not a bad question. All right? How many want to do the things Jesus would do and speak the things Jesus would speak and behave the way Jesus would behave instead of the way we find ourselves behaving and speaking sometimes, right? But here it is, is that this lamb, Jesus, he certainly serves as an example. We sing an old gospel song in here, and the music's fairly new. But the, the, the words of it is called glorious day, right? One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men. My example is he. And that's true, is it not? But that song doesn't end there. You go to the next verse. It says, one day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on a tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected, bearing my sins, my Redeemer is He. In other words, He's not just our example. If He was just our example, it's kind of like the law. How many know if you had to live up to His example in order to be saved, you're done. But He bled and died for the lawbreakers. That's good news. If Jesus had not have died upon the cross, if He was not slain, that means the wrath of God, the righteous wrath of God. We have judgment toward others. We have wrath toward others. And it's oftentimes this unrighteous judgment, unrighteous wrath. Because somehow they've done something to us. They've slighted us in some way. And, and, and so we are upset and we want judgment upon them. Now we want understanding, but we do the same similar things, right? We judge others by their actions and we want to be judged by what we think of as our pure motives, right? But in Jesus, God's judgment is perfectly righteous, and sinners deserve a righteous judgment. But aren't you thankful that Jesus bore that judgment upon the cross for all who repent and put trust in Him? God's wrath was fully poured out upon Christ that we might be forgiven and go free. Isaiah 53 says, God the Father saw the anguish, the suffering of Christ, and He was satisfied. Oh, I, I, I can't tell you how much that word has ministered to me over the course. I, I've known Isaiah 53 for many years, but uh, back on Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, some would say, oh, we've ministered from Isaiah 53, that God's wrath was satisfied. In other words, there's no more punishment needed to be poured out upon those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus paid it all. That's good news. Yeah. So here it is, the lamb had to be slain. There are some who they don't want to talk about the blood. They won't want to talk about Jesus being slain. The, the slain of a lamb. There's blood all throughout the pages of the Old Testament. And it keeps happening over and over again. The blood sacrifices that would be poured out. Brother Todd was witnessing to a gentleman over the course of an email chain. And was witnessing to the man. And the man didn't want to put trust in Christ as being God, as being Savior. And one of the questions Brother Todd rightly asked him was... What do you do with all this blood? If there's no blood necessary, why was all this blood shed? Because it points to the price that has to be paid for sin. Hebrews chapter 9 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Colossians chapter 1 will say that peace between God and man was made where? Through the blood of Christ on the cross. That's where the price was paid. That's where the penalty was exacted. That's where it was that the righteous wrath of God was satisfied upon the Son. How many are thankful? The lamb that was slain for this Passover meal, some 1,500 years, just to make the math easy, before Christ's incarnation, pointed to the Lamb of God who would shed His blood. 
He will be slain. He must die. There has to be the slain of the Lamb. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 18. Jesus will ask His disciples, Who do men say that I am? The disciples will say, Well, some say you're uh, you know, Jeremiah. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're this. Some say you're that. Jesus says, Who do you say that I am? And what does Peter say? He says, You are the Christ. The son of the living God. And what is it that Jesus says back to him? Blessed are you Simon son of John. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my father who is in heaven. You are Peter. And upon this rock. The rock of revelation of the word of God. And of who Jesus is. Not of Peter personally. But upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell or Hades shall not prevail against it. And then what happens? Peter. Then Jesus goes on. And he goes on to talk about how he's got to die. After this great thing, I'm Christ. I'm the Son of God. God's revealed this to you. My church, gates of hell not prevail. All this sounding triumphal kind of talk. Jesus says, but the Son of Man himself, he has to be betrayed. He has to die. He has to be slain. And what does Peter do? He just confessed that Christ was the Son of God. And what does Peter do? He says, oh no, you don't have to die. Come on, quit this death call business. <laughs> and what is it that... Jesus said, that out of the very same mouth that they just said, you're blessed because God's revealed this to you. He says, he says, get thee behind me, Satan, for your mind is on the things of this world and not the things of God. The lamb had to die. The lamb had to be slain. The lamb had to be killed. There had to be blood shed. And this blood must be personally applied. I will tell you, if you look back here into the the Passover meal that we're looking at here. If they didn't kill the lamb, there'd be death, there'd be judgment in their house. But even if they killed the lamb, and the lamb was killed, if there was not blood that was put upon the door, the, the doorpost of the house and the lentils at the top. And by the way, I mentioned this, I forget even what it was in reference to some weeks ago, but I remember saying it. If, if you look at the blood, when you go to a door, and if you put blood on the sides, and you put blood at the top. Guess what happens to the blood at the top? Yes. Drips down. And what do you have between the door, the, the, the door post, and the lintel? What kind of shape do you have? You have the top, you have the post, and then drips down here. You have the shape of a cross 1,500 years before Christ was crucified. In fact, you look in Scripture. So many Psalms, Psalm 22 most especially, the Psalm of the Cross. The dying by crucifixion was not even a thing until the Romans came along. But how many know God knew how his son would die? Right? And, and, and Jesus, in fact, and you look, the Jews, when they wanted to kill somebody, for they would stone them, not crucify them. How many, only God could be so brilliant to foreshadow such a thing. And so here it is, the blood had to be applied to the door of the household because one must receive and believe in Christ personally, like Mary, who in Luke 1, 46, in what we call the Magnificat, she says, my soul rejoices in God, my Savior. How many are thankful to be able to call Him your Savior? Yeah. As we sing tonight, a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. We sing, shout to the Lord, my Jesus, my Savior. How many are thankful for that? You come to the Gospel of John and Thomas, who was known for doubting, but eventually came to faith in Christ. What did he say? My Lord and my God. What did Paul say? He said, I, he trust his life unto Christ, who bled and died for me. It's an old song that says, I have no other argument. I have no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. So the blood, the lamb had to be slain and the blood had to be applied personally. Next, the lamb was roasted and eaten. Now, the lamb was not to be boiled. The lamb was to be roasted and eaten. And there's a, uh, there's a reason for this. And, the, and of course, as you study more scripture throughout your life, you come to find more and more ways that things point to Christ. But if you do historical study into this, the slaves of Egypt, that's God's people at the time, if they were to boil some piece of meat in a pot like a lamb, they didn't have a pot big enough. They had to somehow break that lamb up in some way. But to roast that lamb, the lamb had to stay whole. 
And the lamb, to stay whole, his bones would not be broken. And how many know the Passover lamb, not one bone was broken. The psalm of the cross said he's out of joint, but not one bone was broken. Christ upon the cross, not hit, and certainly he went through a terrible death, but not one bone being broken. And when they went, when the Jewish leaders said, go and break their legs, because that's what they would do to make them die faster. Go and break their legs. They went to test Jesus and they saw that he was already dead. Not one bone was broken. How many know nothing takes God by surprise? I tell you, all these things, they point to who Christ is. 1,500 years, and the lamb would be roasted, not one bone being broken. And then the flesh of that lamb. The lamb, not only did he not have any broken bones, but the lamb had to be eaten. What did Jesus say in John chapter 6? He feeds the multitudes at the beginning of the chapter, feeds the thousands. And what did they do? Well, they liked it when he did miracles for them. And they liked it, when, especially liked it when he multiplied the bread and the loaves and the fishes. Especially in a culture of that day where, I mean, it wasn't like, you know, it, 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 food was, was always plentiful, you know. And so they liked that. But Jesus said to them in John chapter 6, basically they came to him for the loaves and the fishes and what have you. So that we built. But he said, but you've got to eat the living bread. The living bread. He says, you've got to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood or you have no part of me. And many of them heard that and said, this is a tough saying. Who can... Who can go after this? And they departed and went the other way. Now, if you keep reading, Jesus will make it one like you were to be a cannibal and somehow literally go up and eat his, eat his flesh. But he says, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. When the others, at the end of that chapter, when so many turn away from Christ, Christ looks at his disciples and he says, are you going to go away too? And what does Peter say? He says, we have come to know that you and you alone have the words of eternal life. So eating of Christ, drinking of Christ, certainly it speaks to his death, his sacrifice upon the cross. But not literally eating of his flesh and blood, but of eating and partaking of his words and believing in what it is that he has said. The lamb must be eaten. We went here some time ago and said the word of God is likened unto Bread, right? So much food that uh, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So here it is. The lamb had to be roasted and eaten. Not one bone would be broken and it had to be received personally. Now, this lamb would be slain at twilight. Now, when we think of twilight, we think, you know, just before uh, uh, dark or what have you. Uh, I will tell you, we go to Josephus, a Jewish historian of Jesus' day, these lambs were slain, he says, at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Does that ring a bell to you? About 3 o'clock? From the 6th, that's noon, to the ninth hour, that's 3. Jesus died. How many know the Lamb of God died for our sins? Then we come here next. That was the Lamb. If you go back through and read this passage, you will find there were other parts of this meal. One of them was bitter herbs. They read the, they eat these bitter herbs. Now, uh, if you've ever been to a Jewish Seder meal that they call it, a Pass, Passover meal, we had. I went to one uh, in uh, when I was in college. Our Hebrew uh, professor uh, brought us in and, and, and did one of these meals and showing how it pointed to Christ and these bitter herbs. And they had they had this herb, and I tell you, I'm not one. How many of y'all like hot sauce? I can't do strong stuff like that. Mild Taco Bell is too much for me, so I don't do any, any of that sort of thing. And bitter herbs, I don't want none of that bitter stuff. But I will tell you, I went ahead and I took some of these bitter herbs that they passed around, and they will make you cry. And in fact, they're meant to make you cry. Why? Because when you think about the bondage that you were in before you were delivered by the Lamb, it should make you cry. How many, when you look back and you think of the deception that you were under before you were born again, it makes you want to cry? When you think of the things that you used to do and say and harbor in your heart and in your mind before it is that you repented and put trust in Christ and now are informed by the word of God and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, you look back at that and it makes you want to cry. 
You know, tears can be shed for a lot of things. Tears can be shed over the course of crying because of such regret. But tears can also be shed for joy. How many ever had to say, these are, our boy, you know, he's a, he's, a, he's a sensitive young man, for which I'm thankful. I've always said, it's, 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 I'd rather have someone with a sensitive heart than with a cold, callous heart. But our boy, he can be sensitive, and he can cry, and he'll say sometimes, because I'll be, oh, my boy, are you okay? He'll say, these are happy tears. <laughs> How many know that there can be tears of sorrow and of regret? When you think about your life before Christ of the things that you did and harbored and said. But there's also tears that are joy because when you remember where it was that you were and who it was that you were apart from Christ. And now you've been redeemed and forgiven by His grace and for His glory. Your name is in the Lamb's book of life. And things are so much different now. And on their way by God's grace and for His glory to being different still in the future should He tarry. How many are thankful for that? These bitter herbs would cause them to think of their bondage back in Egypt. And then they would have unleavened bread. Unleavened bread. Unleavened bread, basically like a crack, can't have leaven in it. Leaven is a sign, both in Old Testament and in New Testament, it can be representative of sin. Especially sin of hypocrisy. But it can be indicative of sin, leaven can be. And it spreads, and spreads everywhere. And it causes things to... Go up. <laughs> How many know sin does these sorts of things? But when you look at this unleavened bread, it was bread that didn't rise. And when you look at it, it looks like a cracker. And you might have never eaten unleavened matzo bread, this sort of thing. But most everybody here is eating a cracker. You see a cracker. You know how it has the stripes on it? And holes in it, too. How many know he was pierced for our transgressions? Right? And here it is, is that the stripes says that by his stripes, we are healed. And the primary context in Isaiah 53 there is of is forgiveness, the healing of our soul. But any good that you experience in your body, in your spirit, calls a Christ's sacrifice upon the cross. And literally, it means by his stripe in the New Testament, singular. Instead of stripes, plural, it's stripes, singular. Because when Jesus was beaten, he had so many stripes, you couldn't tell where one ended and the other one began. How many are thankful he was willing to do that for you? Here it is. And there's all kinds of things in the Jewish center where they will take and they'll, they'll break up this and that'll be like the middle cracker and they'll hold it out of three like the second person in the Godhead. But then at, by the end of the meal, that broken cracker comes back out. Why? Because Christ was raised from the dead. But here it is. You have this unleavened, this unleavened bread, which again points to Christ as well. Now, the last thing I want to point out is this. This Passover meal in Exodus chapter 12. We've looked at so many ways. Again, this is about 1500 B.C. How many know it points to Christ in so many ways we've talked of tonight? The lamb chosen, a, 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 a beloved lamb, a spotless lamb, an examined lamb, a slain lamb, a lamb with no broken bones. Right? These sorts of things. The lamb had to be eaten. The blood had to be applied. Okay? But in Exodus chapter 12, they're getting these instructions about the Passover meal for the first time. They will have Passovers in the future that they have, and they look back to remember what happened back then. But right now, they haven't experienced this yet. They are having this Passover meal, if you will, in advance. In other words, this plague hasn't taken place yet when they get the instructions at the beginning of Exodus chapter 12. The plague hadn't taken place. Their firstborn had not yet died. They were still in bondage. They had not been let go. They had not been through the Red Sea. They, all this hadn't happened when they got the instructions for this first Passover meal. So for the first Passover meal, they're not looking back. They're looking ahead. In other words, what I mean is, when they go out there and they get this lamb and they take it in for the four days. When they get this lamb and they slay it and then they put its blood on their, 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 the doors of their house. When they eat of this lamb... They're still in Egyptian bondage. The firstborn has not yet died in the house of Egypt yet. They've not been delivered out, but they're having this. And how many know? They're doing it on the front side in Exodus chapter 12. And they're doing it in faith for what will come. What is their faith? Their faith is there's going to come a judgment. God said there'll be a judgment. How many know God says there'll be a judgment? 
There are many in this world that say, hey, the world just keeps on ticking no matter what we do. And so it doesn't matter what we say or what we do. And we're just going to keep on sinning in gross and sundry ways. And it just doesn't seem that how many know God will bring a judgment someday. Yes. There will come a judgment. These people, when they slayed the lamb, it was faith that judgment was going to come. When these people, they slayed the lamb and they followed these instructions, it was also faith that they would be delivered because God said, if the lamb's blood is there, I'll pass over you. So it was faith in the judgment of God. It was faith in the deliverance of God. And how many know it was faith that you see someone say, well, they were saved by their work of no. Why did they do the work? Because they had faith in what God had said. And so it is that they did this Passover thing. And I tell you, when you think about this, think about somebody. Look here. Verse 30. Pharaoh arose in the night of that plague. He and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry at each. Can you imagine the cry at midnight? Now, I remember one time, and I kind of go back and, 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 and forth on this, but in one of my classes in college, I remember, they would do these uh, dramas to dramatize some things from Scripture. And I, I, I don't know if, if that's exactly the thing to do all the time, but I will. And, and if I had that class to go back and talk to the main instructor about, I might would do things different. But I would tell you, one powerful thing was this. When they were illustrating this, they turned all the lights off in the room. And they had two or three of their group that just wailed for just about five seconds. And I tell you what, it did make me think, can you imagine what it must have been like at midnight in Egypt? The wailing, the judgment of God that came about. They didn't believe it would. If they had believed it would have taken place, how I many of them would have done something different? They didn't believe it would take place. They're wailing, they're crying. Such a great cry. The people of God that had slain that Passover lamb and done that, they believed the judgment would come. But they also believed that the deliverer would come if indeed the blood was over their door. They were looking forward to something that was going to happen that night. Right? That, later on that night. That's when things, after the blood's on the door, later on that night, judgment was going to come. But if you had the lamb, then you'd be saved or delivered. How many know? They might not have, in fact, no doubt they fully didn't realize it then. But what they did... And Exodus chapter 12 was not just pointing forward to something that was going to happen that night, but forward 1,500 years to something that was going to happen when the Lamb of God was slain on the hill called Calvary for you and for me. And can I tell you, for us, when we think about this Passover meal, when we have things, that, that when we have communion and things like this, we do remember the Lord's death till He comes. But how many are thankful? It is remembering the Lord's death going back. Until he comes in the future. There's still a forward glance of the people of God. Because we believe the same God who 1500 years before Christ had this meal that pointed to him coming. The same God who made all those promises and fulfilled them to the teeth. About the Lamb of God coming, not his bones not being broken. All the rest of the things that we've talked about tonight. How many know that same God said that, that, that he's coming back again to receive us unto himself. And that's good news. Because he's faithful to his promise, is he not? Let's stand our feet tonight. Lord, we thank you for your word, for this meaningful meal of Passover that we've looked at to some degree tonight. We thank you for the, just as they ate this lamb and all the details, it had to be a beloved lamb and an inspected lamb, an unblemished lamb. The lamb had to be eaten, the blood applied personally, with the bitter herbs to remind of the past and the unleavened bread to remind of uh, uh, the need for purity and that Christ would be that pure one who would bear the stripes for us. All these things that we've looked at tonight, we stand in awe. And Lord, if there's even one here tonight that knows not Christ, they've not put their trust in this lamb. The, the lamb, not a lamb that they would eat for Passover, but the lamb who would come, who would die on the cross once for all for the sins of the world and shed his blood. There be no need for the shedding of any more blood, no more blood of bulls and goats that was only pointing to Christ, the Lamb of God who was to come. If there's anyone here that's not trusted in Christ, who's not repented of sin, put trust in His sacrifice on the cross and in His raising from the dead alone for their salvation, I pray they come in something like this. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sin. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. You, Jesus, are the only Savior. 
make me your child. Lord, for those who are your people, we thank you for your word, your rich word, which points so wonderfully to Christ, our wonderful Savior, our wonderful Lord. And Lord, I pray that every heart here tonight be encouraged and blessed and strengthened by your word tonight. Strengthen the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen in their most holy faith. Strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Of hearing of the Christ who died for me. For them. For all who trust and believe. Lord, I pray hearts be encouraged and strengthened. Bless my brothers and sisters this night. Bless them as they get ready to go back to their homes. And Lord, this storm that thankfully is not too bad. I pray you would just... Strengthen them and give all grace through it. And Lord, we just pray your hand extended to every need tonight. We give you praise and we give you glory both now and evermore. In Jesus' name we pray in the power of the Spirit we come. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. May you know it is the hope you're calling of God in Christ Jesus. And the surpassing greatness of his power extended to all who believe. Amen and amen. amen. God bless you tonight in Jesus' name. What's that? Yeah, at least, at least. It might be longer because I've come up with some... some